was charged with sex trafficking for activities in New York City was business partners with a very important Israeli. I've been writing a book about Syria and one of the entry points I think to understand what's happening in Syria is to think about it not just about you know the geopolitics and Iran interference and US and, uh, and Russia and so on but uh, rather about you know think about the politics of death and the politics of life. Hello my name is Stanley Heller welcome to the struggle. The Israeli newspaper Haaretz has a scoop it seems that convicted sex offender Jeffrey Epstein, who was recently rearrested and was charged with sex trafficking for activities in New York City, was business partners with a very important Israeli. That Israeli was former Prime Minister Ehud Barak. Haaretz's Epstein invested millions in a Barack startup company in 2015. That was seven years after Epstein had a, agreed to a plea deal for soliciting prostitution with girls as young as 14. That conviction apparently did not prevent Barack from taking Epstein's investment money. The article also mentions that Jeffrey Epstein financed and managed the Wexner Foundation, a philanthropic organization that operates training programs to advance leadership and excellence in Israel. We're proud to say we picketed Ehud Barak years ago when he spoke in New Haven for his brutal activities as Israeli Prime Minister. We'll link to the Haaretz article on our site, thestruggle.org. This is a picture of Rafi Peretz when he was chief military rabbi of the Israeli Defense Forces, a post equivalent to the position of brigadier general. He's a politician now in the United Right Coalition with Kahanist fascist forces. He's also Education Minister of Israel. This week he made remarks claiming that intermarriage of Jews and non-Jews is the equivalent of a second Holocaust. To him, marrying a Christian or a Muslim is just like a Nazi murdering a Jew. A group of Orthodox rabbis called the Coalition for Jewish Values defended his statement. This shows you the level of fanaticism at the very top of the Jewish state. American rapper Talib Kweli Green responded to BDS requests and canceled his gig in Israel. He tweeted, when I canceled the Israel show I got called the n-word and monkey and all types of crap from these Zionist trolls and it immediately made me feel like I made the right decision. These are photos from the Fang Collective which recently closed the entrance to a Massachusetts prison for a couple of hours to protest collaboration between Massachusetts authorities and ICE. FANG stands for Fight Against Natural Gas, but it has expanded its program to other justice matters. Three of those in the action were arrested. Two took a plea for a 10-day sentence in jail. One is contesting the arrest and will go to trial. For more about FANG, go to Facebook and search for The FANG Collective. The bulk of our program will be the first part of Emerson Professor Yasser Munaf's talk in New Haven about Syria. He concentrates on the divide and conquer tactics Assad used to seize East Aleppo. It's my privilege to introduce Yasser Munaf. 
He's a professor of sociology at Emerson College up in Boston. And uh, he's also active uh, with the, um, let's see, the coalition's name, the campaign, I'm sorry, campaign for solidarity with the Syrian revolution. So I'm also uh, a member of the Alliance of Middle Eastern and North African Socialists. And the Alliance um, works on supporting the revolts in the entire Arab world in the Middle East. And I think this is very important. Uh, what we have in the Arab world in the Middle East is a wave of protests that started in 2009 with Iran and has been going on. Uh, and I think um, it's important to think about the Arab revolt as a long process. It's not a number of months, it's not a number of weeks, it's in the, in the years, maybe decades. And we see eruption. Every few years we see a new eruption. Um, most recently with Sudan and, and with uh, Algeria. And I think this is going to go on for, for, for a while. What we are seeing is the demise of the dictatorial order. And there is no going back. I think that the Arab people, the people in the Middle East and North Africa, have burst a bubble and there is no going back. And this is why we see so much violence from the Arab regimes. Um, Syria, um, one thing I will say just to, uh, as a continuation of what Sina mentioned, which is uh, the different groups and coalitions that are working against, uh, against war um, in the US. And I think they have become monsters uh, for one simple reason. Um, they have a tendency to focus only on American wars in the Middle East, and they completely forget what those Arab dictators are doing to their population. If you look at Syria, for example, 90% of those who were killed in Syria were killed by the Syrian regime, not by the US bombs, not by ISIS, not by Al-Qaeda, not by the opposition. And this is important to keep in mind. If, we're really, if we are really serious about building uh, a large coalition, anti-war coalition, we have to think about ways to think from the standpoint of the people who are struggling on the ground and not just dismiss them, ignore them, and just be Americanocentric and think about our own wars, um, which is egoistic. I mean, even for leftists uh, to think about you know, war as an evil, as just emanating from the US is very simplistic, very one-dimensional. Um, Arab dictators and uh, dictators, dictators in the Middle East are extremely violent and um, they are causing the deaths of people in Syria and Egypt and, and, uh, and elsewhere. Um, the other thing I would say is um, one of the slogans we came up with in 2002 when the U.S. was preparing for the war uh, against uh, Iraq was no war, no dictatorships in, in plural. And we got hit, heat from both sides. People who were saying you are delusional, delusional you have to concentrate on uh, the war against uh, and, you know, uh, and, and uh, formulated slogans against the U.S. and so on. And those who were viewing you know, uh, the other side were uh, you know, trying to liberate Iraq uh, with uh, uh, American tanks and, and so on. And I think this is an important slogan uh, when you think about the Middle East. No wars and no dictatorships. Um, so Syria, uh, one of the most important slogans uh, that Riyad al-Turk came up with, uh, one of the important uh, prisoners, uh, political prisoners, he spent 19 years in, in prison, I think, uh, was that uh, he called Syria the kingdom of science. Uh, and, and, and the Syrian regime uh, came to power in 1963 uh, with the Ba'ath, and then in 1970 with Assad, uh, when he was able to put all his opponents in, in, in prison. And, uh, and was able to impose that, uh, you know, uh, politics of fear and politics of, of silence. You can't say anything against the regime. There are multiple branches of security that will silence anyone, would kill, torture, kidnap, and put in prison anyone who dare to, you know, to oppose the regime. And what happened in 2011 is breaking that silence. And since that 2011 up, up until now, uh, the regime has been trying to reimpose that silence. And this is why we see so much violence um, and so much death. Uh, and I've, I've been writing a book about Syria, and one of the entry points, I think, to understand what's happening in Syria is to think about it, not just about you know, the geopolitics and Iran interference and US and, uh, and Russia and so on, but uh, rather about, you know, think about the politics of death and the politics of life. Um, and this is the, the topic of, of my presentation. 
uh, to think about Syria and those two forces, the people who are trying to, you know, live and create livable, uh, you know, spaces and livable uh, cities and create uh, institutions that, you know, support their communities and their livelihood, and the regime, the Syrian regime, who are trying to kill them. Um, so can we go to the second? Um, this is uh, from 1492. Uh, Leave, convert, or die, King Ferdinand and Queen Elizabeth, uh, Isabella, uh, to the Jews of, of Spain. Um, but ISIS used it in, 2000, in 2014 against the Christian, uh, leave, convert, or die. And I think to a certain extent the Syrian regime has used it against the Syrian population. In the context of Aleppo, which is uh, the focus of my talk, uh, either leave, and uh, when the, the war on Aleppo started, uh, there were approximately 1.5 million people in East Aleppo, which was uh, controlled by the opposition. When uh, Aleppo uh, was taken back by the Syrian regime, there were a little bit more than 100,000. So completely displaced the population. Leave Convert, not necessarily in the sense of uh, religion, but rather in the sense of Assadism. You have to embrace um, you know, Assad uh, and, and you know, go back to this kingdom of silence. Um, there is a French saying, uh, which, uh, which is uh, the, the silence of the slippers, you know, the, the slippers uh, in the household, uh, is more dangerous than the boots of the military. And the Syrian regime was able to silence a large part of the Syrian population. Um, because of fear, people were not necessarily outspoken. They didn't speak against the Syrian regime. And so that's the meaning of convert, go to back to the silence, and die. Um, a, a very large number of, of uh, people died in, in Aleppo, just to, get, to take that uh, example. Can we go to the... Um... So this is uh, a map of Aleppo back in 2013. Click it, all right, let me try this. Okay. Yeah, so these are uh, the uh, regime uh, positions in, in orange. Uh, this is East Aleppo, uh, which was controlled by the opposition. And here are the Kurdish area in, in yellow. Um, what's interesting uh, are those two points. This is uh, the citadel of Aleppo, and this is here uh, the Ottoman barracks from the 19th century. Um, and so what I want to show is how space was utilized and deployed by the Syrian regime uh, as weapons of mass destruction against the population. Um, the next map is from the 1840s. This is an Ottoman map. And here you can see uh, the Ottoman barrack, which was built around 1840 and was used again by the Syrian regime. Um, there was a riot in, 19, in 1850 uh, between the people who lived in East Aleppo, which are the poor and the Bedouins, and the Ottoman military, uh, who are, were uh, also poor, and they rioted against the rich population in Western Aleppo, and the Western population moved to um, to further west, and you're going to see that 150 years later uh, with um, the map that you know was uh, put in place between opposition and uh, and and, uh, and the Syrian regime. The western part of the city is the rich part. The eastern part of the city is, is the poor part. This is from 18, uh, 1982, there was, uh, or 1980, I should say. There was a revolt in Aleppo, and it was crushed very, very uh, violently uh, by the Syrian regime. Again, here you can see the citadel. Uh, and those are the rebellious regions. Um, they're very poor. And they are also uh, mostly uh, informal uh, housing. Um, and, and that's going to be one of the ways the Syrian regime is going to uh, control the, the city. The presentation is about how space was utilized by the Syrian regime. And one of the things I wanted to show is um, the different uh, strategies used by the Syrian regime, spatial strategies used by the Syrian regime to control the, the, the city. Uh, one of those were um, the horizontal power and the vertical power. The horizontal power is everything that happens on the, you know, on the horizontal uh, uh, plane, meaning uh, the mobile uh, militias who go around and terrorize the population, arrest people, kidnap them, put them in prison. And you're going to see uh, the different tribes uh, 
um, that were working for the Syrian regime in stopping people and putting them in, 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 in prison. And then you have the military branches, the military bases all around the city um, that the Syrian regime has put because of the rebellion, but also what he inherited from the French uh, mandate and, and the, the Ottoman, uh, as I mentioned before. And, um, and so he segmented the, 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 uh, complete the, 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 the city and um, he sent his militias and the, the tribes to, uh, to arrest people. And then you have the vertical power. What do we mean by the vertical power? This is all the, um, you know, the sky power and the air power, uh, the, the dropping of the barrel bombs, but also all, all the high structure and the high building, the tallest buildings. What, there is a map of the tallest buildings in, uh, in Aleppo, and they're all in Western Aleppo. You can see uh, the citadel, which was controlled by the Syrian regime. You can see the mosques, the highest or the tallest mosque, which were controlled by the, the Syrian regime. Uh, the luxurious hotel, hotels, which were also controlled by, by the Syrian regime. And, um, and the Syrian regime put snipers on all these. Um, and they had a very clear view on what was happening in uh, Eastern Aleppo. Um, according to the Syrian American uh, Medical Society, 30% of those who were killed in, in Aleppo were killed by snipers. Uh, the Syrian regime put around 100 snipers on the citadel, and it was completely uh, impossible for the opposition to, to take it. Uh, they killed many, many people uh, with, with the snipers. Um, and so what's interesting is you can see, if you look at those tallest buildings, they are uh, either mosques, so the uh, state-sponsored religion, uh, the Syrian regime built a number of mosques to show that they're Alawite, Shia, but they still care for, you know, for religion. And they were building all these mosques for the Sunni in the city. Aleppo is a very Sunni uh, city. Um, and so they were, those mosques were, were used by the snipers to, to kill the population on, in Eastern Aleppo. Then you have the luxurious hotels. Um, and this is the second group that was allied to the Syrian regime. All the capitalists, the bourgeois, uh, that the Syrian regime was, was allowing to build all these luxurious hotels. And you can see how the snipers were positioned on this, uh, in those luxurious hotels. Um, thirdly, you can see all the old structures in the city, uh, meaning the, the citadel and the, uh, the barrack, the Ottoman barracks and, and so on. And uh, they were weaponized and utilized against uh, Eastern uh, Aleppo. Um, and, and finally, you can see um, the, the, the barrel bombs, uh, which were extremely, extremely uh, lethal in, in Eastern Aleppo. Uh, they destroyed a major part of Aleppo. And what's one of the interesting things about uh, you know, the strategy of the, of the regime is that they were uh, already thinking about reconstruction. And so one of the things they were, and you can see that this is not you know, uh, um, specific to the Syrian regime, I think it was done here in the US and it's done everywhere, um, how um, they were destroying an entire neighborhood, an entire you know, uh, neighborhood with informal housing, neighborhood that uh, the, the uh, neoliberal class and the capitalist class wanted to um, appropriate the land and build big project on, on them. And so those were the most affected by the barrel bombs. They were completely destroyed. And therefore, the regime was destroying in order to redevelop and rebuild. And that was in their mind, especially in 2015 and 2016, uh, completely eradicating the entire neighborhood so that you know, some, someone was uh, asked the Syrian regime that they wanted this land or that land uh, to develop a project, a uh, luxurious hotel or a mall and, and so on. And those were uh, some of the most affected uh, neighborhood. Um, so they, they were completely erased from, from the map. And, uh, and now there, there are uh, a number of people who are bidding the Russian and the Iranian and the uh, Syrian capitalist class uh, on some of, of those um, neighborhoods. So what I wanted to, to show is how the Syrian regime weaponized demographics, meaning poor against rich, um, different ethnic groups, diff different tribes, um, different ethnicities and, and sects uh, uh, against uh, uh, each other. And then what I mentioned, the horizontal power and the vertical power, 
what was happening on the ground, but also what was happening, um, you know, with the So it's not an understatement to say that, um, you know, it was a, a war between the poor and, and, uh, and the wealthy. Here you can see a map of the uh, informal housing in, in pink. Uh, so all these areas are uh, informal housing. And this, this is the affluent housing. This is the old. Um, the Syrian regime also neutralized the Palestinian, which is uh, very interesting because in Damascus it wasn't able to do so. Uh, it neutralized the two camps uh, in Aleppo, Nairab and Handarat. Uh, um, it did so by uh, kidnapping a bus of uh, Palestinian fighters and killed them. And there was a lot of confusion. It wasn't uh, uh, clear who killed the, the, the Palestinian. 14 people were killed. And it turned completely uh, Al Nayra uh, camp and then Handarat uh, against the, the, the rebellion. There were protests in the camps, and very quickly they turned against the uh, opposition. Uh, in 2015, when the opposition liberated Idlib, they found uh, pictures of some of those people who were killed, tortured in the security branch inside the city of uh, Idlib. And they knew that they were, there was a proof. I mean, most people knew in the opposition that the regime did it, but they had the proof that the regime uh, did it with pictures. It was too late, obviously. Here is uh, the uh, Kurdish areas. Um, and by the way, some of those Kurds were um, were displaced by the Syrian regime in the 1960s and 70s. The Syrian regime was uh, trying to create an Arab belt um, uh, around the Turkish border, was trying to displace and remove the Kurds from those regions because it, it was um, afraid that uh, they would build uh, a Kurdish nation with Iran and, uh, and Iraq and, uh, and Turkey. So it was removing all those Kurds from those regions. And some of them ended in, uh, in, uh, in Aleppo. And, um, and the Kurds, I mean, it's a complex story, but they were neutral and sometimes, but at the end in 2015 and 16, they, were, they played a major role in helping the regime to take back um, Aleppo. Uh, those are the Christian areas. And uh, by the way, many of those people moved here in uh, 1850, 1860. So 160 years uh, later, uh, the Syrian regime weaponized them against uh, mostly Sunni areas here. Um, and so they were the, the Syrian regime created Armenian and Christian militias uh, to fight against uh, the Sunni. And so what I'm trying to say here is how the Syrian regime weaponized all these, the, the demographics of the city against the revolution. And it, um, it's, it's specific to Aleppo, but you can find uh, traces of, of that in other places. Here are the tribe, the famous uh, Al-Birri uh, tribe. Which, was, which became one of the most violent uh, militias in Aleppo. Uh, and they were in, uh, in the old city here, and in Salhim in, in here. Um, and so they were part of the mobile militias, uh, arresting people and, and, and killing them, uh, putting them in prison. Um, some people say that uh, Al-Birri tribe had 5,000 people, um, and they were transformed into a militia. So uh, the other thing that the Syrian regime w did was uh, the, um, the weaponization of, uh, of the medical field. Uh, it attacked uh, medical facilities and hospitals and uh, the white helmets and, and so on. And um, this is very effective from the standpoint of the Syrian regime because when you kill, there is actually one of the generals said, um, when you kill a fighter, you just kill a fighter. When you kill uh, a doctor, uh, you prevent that doctor from, um, you know, uh, uh, providing help to hundreds or thousands of, of fighters. Uh, so the Syrian regime understood the strategic importance of the medical field, and it was targeted. And now, right now, it's being targeted in, in, in Idlib. Uh, it also targeted the bakeries. Uh, and again, this idea of targeting any source of life, politics of life and politics of, of death, in direct confrontation, uh, in, in Aleppo and elsewhere. This is one of the most lethal checkpoints in Aleppo. Uh, and it was targeted by the snipers uh, every day. And some people had to cross the, 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 the checkpoint to get bread and to see relatives and to go to work and, and so on. And one of the things that the snipers did was, um, it was very vicious. Um, sometimes they, um, they played game uh, as snipers. And so, for example, the doctor would say that in the morning, if they saw uh, a pregnant woman being um, shot 
in, in, in her belly, they knew that it's going to be an entire day of pregnant women being shot. And that was you know, one of their bets. Or, for example, trying to kill two people with one bullet. So that was you know, another form of um, enjoyment or entertainment for the snipers, uh, targeting people crossing the, uh, that checkpoint. Uh, this is the vertical power I was talking about. So this is a hotel here, and this is the city hall, and they were both used by snipers, um, and um, they have a very good view of the, of the city. Yeah, so all the snipers, those are all the tallest buildings. Again, it overlaps completely with the Syrian regime uh, region. This is the opposition, this is the Syrian regime. And so there are all sorts of buildings. You have mosques, you have the city hall, you have uh, luxurious hotels, and they were completely controlled by the Syrian, uh, by the Syrian regime. And so they had like complete control uh, over the, the vertical power, uh, what is called the vertical power. And you have basically here four uh, snipers positions. And you can see the kind of view that they had. They completely paralyzed the opposition areas, and they had a complete view of, of the opposition. This is one, uh, this was called the Tahrir Square of Aleppo. This is the region that uh, people were trying to reach and were never able to. Um, they were able to once or twice, uh, but they were removed by the Syrian regime very quickly. Uh, the Syrian regime was very uh, fearful that um, something like uh, uh, Cairo might happen, and so they were preventing people from reaching that, uh, that region. This is the consequence of barrel bombs uh, and the, the asymmetrical destruction of, of Aleppo again. More of the talk next week. Reuters has an interesting article on Syria, on Idlib, noticing that after two months of brutal Assadist assault, Idlib has not fallen. This is an area in the northwest with three million people. It has not fallen to Assad. The writers of the article ascribe it to Turkish support and plentiful anti-tank weapons. We'll link to the article on thestruggle.org. That's our program for today. See you next week at this time. I'm Stanley Heller for The Struggle.